Okay, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining this presentation. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to presenting in front of some people again after now uh, two years of absence and corona and having like virtual conferences and everything. And yeah, now I start a bit about myself. So I'm, I'm Fabian. So I'm, uh, I'm based in uh, Berlin, and until, yeah, very recently, uh, I worked for Viverica, who are the actual the founders of Apache Flink. And I'm also an Apache Flink committer, and I will basically tell you now in the next, like, hopefully 35 minutes about uh, what uh, we've redesigned um, the sync framework in Apache Flink and how it now supports basically also writing to, like, most of the... Uh, modern um, data lakes, be it like Apache Iceberg, be it Apache Hoodie, what you've heard before in, in this presentation room, or um, even Delta Lake. So let's start first. So what is Viverica? So basically, um, probably some of you have already uh, heard Apache Flink before. I know this summit used to be before the Spark summit. So Spark and, in general, Spark and Apache Flink are quite similar. It's basically both are distributed processing frameworks supporting um, batch and streaming queries. And Viverica consists of the original founders of the Apache project and basically offers like a managed service. So if you want to run like managed Flink services, like Viverica is, is a go-to partner for that. So now what exactly is Apache Flink? As I already outlined there, basically from the outside world, you, you can run queries, you can in, run in a distributed fashion, but in the end, there are like definitely subtle differences between Spark and Flink, especially when it comes to about fault tolerance, and this will be also relevant uh, when it comes to basically how do you ensure to write files to, or how do you ensure to write uh, records in either streaming or batch fashion to external systems. That's why m my first thing in my talk will be about like what kind of internals um, does Apache Flink support and how do they look like. So um, this is basically the overview of what Apache Flink currently looks like. You can <coughs> you have multiple input formats, be it like transactions coming in or logs or IoT, and th they can be either, we call them like unbounded or bounded streams, so both kind of processing modes are supported, and then Flink does, does its job by processing the incoming data and writing that out again. Either you write to like some sort of like um, log-based format, be it like Kafka, or you can also write them to distributed files or even databases. And the main aspect we want to look into today is basically this last point. So how do we get the data out of Flink? So it has been already processed by the custom logic you write, you know, be it in, in, in some sort of query, be it through SQL, or be it even through your custom operators um, you've written before. So um, the first thing I basically uh, want to start is how does this in general look like? So in the end, if you imagine like Flink runs very special to Spark, you have a lot of like different functions. They somehow work together and they transform the input to any output and need to write it um, somewhere. And the most important part is because the whole thing would be very, uh, very unuseful if you cannot have state. So basically, at some point, your function needs to remember, especially in terms of like failover or these kind of scenarios, needs to remember what it has already processed or what it has already been seen. And we call basically everything in Flink that needs to outlive like these kind of outages like state. And the most important one is state cannot be lost during any failure or anything because otherwise there are no guarantees anymore um, to do like ex exactly once processing. Um, and the, in, in Flink's ideas, basically, it's different to Spark, where you basically have an RDD and you, you can rely on your, line, your lineage. It's basically the whole, um, uh, the whole fault tolerance mechanism is built around checkpoints. What, che what checkpoints exactly are, I will show you um, on the following slides, but the basic idea is that just periodically, um, every operator takes a snapshot of its current state, basically what it has currently processed, and writes it to a um, persistent storage. So most of the time, it's some sort of like um, object storage, like S3 or Azure ADLS. Um, so when it now comes to like how do they look like, now you, you can see an image where basically three bubbles are basically some custom operators that are defined through your pipeline. And the squares are basically records going through. And what you already can see, like there's, there are these like brownish, um, brownish lines. These we call like checkpoint barriers. Basically, like how checkpoints in Apache Flink work, they basically go to travel through the data flow with your data. So basically, it's always guaranteed that the 
same sort of record is between two checkpoint barriers. So it, it, it can never happen that one record jumps between, um, between the checkpoint barriers on a recovery. So what then basically means, if you have like two sources and they're doing, going into one aggregation, is that uh, like to ha have like a successful checkpoint interval of the whole pipeline of your job, it needs to be ensured that all that basically all the downstream operators have received all the checkpoint barriers from upstream operators. So this is what actually happened. It now travels through, and eventually source one is finished and says, okay, now the aggregation has received the first checkpoint barrier. Now it waits for the second one. The second one travels also through. Now, okay, all barriers are received. And if your aggregation is basically the last one in the pipeline, now it starts the actual checkpoint process to ensure that in case something is failed, we can recover from it. So now the local state that has been checkpointed needs to be written to this checkpoint storage, which is, we can just in our example take it as S3. And then we're done and we can continue processing. And in case of a failure, we can easily recover our state if we read like the metadata from S3 and then see what kind of state we need to load into the local processing, basically. So that's an, like a yeah, very short view how Flink does uh, fault tolerance. And this also brings me now to the actual topic of this presentation. What kind of things or uh, sync frameworks we supported over the years? So the first thing is just as a function, as the name already holds, like the sync function. And the sync function is a very basic idea of, okay, we go back to our functional model, we have some input and some output, and as you've seen before, like these kind of operators, like the, it's basically users can define what kind of, basically, things are written into state and what kind of, when they write the data outside. And th this has also received like multiple extension over the years, but in the end, like, this was also back in the time where the Lambda architecture was, like, at least getting somehow deprecated, so more and more users wanted to have, like, real-time streaming application that could offer end-to-end, end-to-end, um, exactly once guarantees, and not, like, okay, streaming is seen as, like, some sort of, like, eventual consistent thing, or maybe even, like, accurate, uh, in, inaccurate computations, and, and your batch job is still the source of truth, so now we want to, like, give our users basically the are the connector developers for these external systems the capability to build exactly once um, connectors. And the idea is that we have to define like, a different framework. But this is still like the old sync framework and I can uh, tell you now, now this is basically this, this simple idea. We have again our checkpoint barrier and our records in red and it's traveling through and basically the idea is simple. We, we, the sync function waits for the checkpoint barrier and then pushes to the external system. This is like the most simple sync function, but this obviously cannot guarantee like exactly once, but it can only be um, at best at least once because we cannot roll back anything, we don't have any mechanism of transactions, and yeah, this is where we ended up with. So now the question is again, how do we ensure exactly once, and how do we make it easier that basically any developer can use the framework inside of Flink and don't need to worry about these kind of abstractions? Mm, another topic which came up through that time was that um, Flink also became like a batch engine. So nowadays it's, it's obvious for everyone, like already was presented in one of the keynotes, that these kind of modern processing framework need to be unified. So the, the end user should not care about like if it's like running a batch or if it's running streaming, and th this should be the same for the developers they want to connect to external systems. They, are, they should not build like two sources, either in batch mode or in streaming mode, they should build one, and then the engine should take care of what's, what will happen in the end. So this is basically the first iteration which we call like unified sync, because it supports like streaming and batch at the same time, and you only have to build like your code once, and it can run in both modes. Um, yeah, and this whole idea was built around um, like a two-phase commit protocol, which is probably quite familiar to most of you because it's like a known principle in like the database world. And like the two-phase commit protocol was built around like two kind of operators that were like cr created in the background as part of the framework. One is called the writer operator, and one is called the committer operator. And basically, the everything what the writer does is basically writing to the external system. This is part of the first commit, and then finally, once like the checkpoint is completed like for the whole pipeline because obviously the things are always the last operators in your pipeline when writing to an external system. Um, only when like the full checkpoint is acknowledged, they can actually tell the external system, okay, now we're done, we, we know we won't see this data again and it's also already persisted in the external system. And how does this look in practice? 
So this is basically like a normal pipeline. We start again, but not in, in comparison to what we've seen before. It's not like only the sync function, but we now have actually two operators now. And, but, but from a programmatic point, this is completely transparent from the user. So the user don't need to worry about these kind of abstractions. It's basically just you build your sync, and then in the end, it will all be um, basically compiled into this kind of abstraction. So basically, the records are coming into the writer, and the writer, it's, it's yeah, pretty easy build. It's just you have to build your API on how, to, how do you actually write the um, records to an external system. Either it's like through files, you batch your files into Parquet or write into Parquet files and upload them, or you, for example, write to Apache Kafka. And then we already see, okay, now the checkpoint barrier is coming up. What's happening next? So the idea is basically what we do on, on point of the checkpoint barrier is that the writer basically says, okay, for example, if we think about like the external system supports transaction, we have written all the um, data that has been seen so far in like the single transaction, and now this is in, in like some sort of pending state, which is not really committed yet. And then we basically say, okay, we send this specialized metadata message to the committer on receiving the checkpoint barrier and saying, okay, now committer, you need to commit this transaction because this is still in like a pending state. And only if like the committer basically received this one metadata, since we are still part of the before the checkpoint barrier, it means that now the committer internally, that's also nothing the user needs to worry about, is basically writing all this kind of committable, it's received to state. One important caveat here is that if you write something into state, it also needs to be like, it cannot um, contain like large amounts of data because the state is only for metadata in the end. Um, so basically, it, it now has to wait until all the tasks in, the, in, in like a whole streaming job have basically acknowledged that the checkpoint is done. And then once this has been done, the committer goes into the external system and says, okay, finalize my transactions, and all records are then written to the external system. So that's the basic idea of it. So this is now the question. So we thought about like a few years back, we like, okay, that's like a nice system. We saw a lot of adoption, and yeah, I mean, it, it worked quite well in general for like all these kind of message queues and everything, and yeah, and databases and files also work quite well. And it, and it also like it alleviated a lot of these kind of problems we were seeing, like that connector developers worried about, okay, can my, uh, can my connector basically run in streaming mode? Can it be in batch mode? Or we've also seen a lot of things that it's not really easy to like come up with a good exactly one abstraction if you don't have like a framework for it because everyone started to reinventing the wheel using like different kind of technologies. We had like in the open source like multiple implementations of like a two-phase commit protocol, but some of them were, were more, more potent, some of them were like lacking functionality and we basically just consolidated everything in one which really helped. Although, since it's mainly like an open source project, we had to go through like multiple community iterations and had to convince like different stakeholders that this is like the right way to do. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> now, a new problem came up. I think this is also like something you've basically seen all around this day is like that once we move more and more to this, to these kind of Lakos architectures, it's uh, really hard to maintain like uh, a suitable file size. So the problem is basically that in Flink, it's usually very, th these kind of checkpoint intervals, uh, you've seen like the checkpoint areas travel through your data pretty quickly. So we're talking about like sub-second um, latency in the end. And every time the checkpoint barrier arrives, you're basically writing files out in these kind of um, lake stores. The problem is that this creates like many small files. And so far in the current, <coughs> Sync design, this was basically not, not anything they could handle. I mean, yeah, it's nice that you can basically now develop a, exactly one's applications, but there was actually some lack of like um, extensibility. And we basically did like a survey with like the Delta Lake people with Apache Iceberg, and they said, hey, we, we wanna do something different. We wanna integrate more things inside of the connector. I mean, you've most of the time already have like a long running streaming pipeline, so you can do more in your sync already, which basically improves the data layout from the beginning. And yeah, so this is what we've come up with. So we went back to the drawing board, and the next thing is basically like, yeah, one of the brand new features in Apache Flink, and I will show you what we came up with. <clears throat> so this is now, we, uh, we call it basically the um, extensible uh, unified sync. And yeah, this is, so the 
first idea we had basically was to, because what we've seen before was <coughs> that the previous sync framework was pretty convoluted and also sometimes hard to understand, and we wanted to, ber to, to break it down in like a simple like flowchart in, in the end at the beginning. Because we were seeing that, okay, there are also like systems that do not require exactly once processing. For example, if like your downstream system is maybe like a key value store and you can guarantee item potent rights, it's fine if you're streaming like if your streaming connector is only guaranteeing at least once because you're getting this kind of exactly once uh, processing by the external system. And, and of course, like everything basically as high as you get up the delivery guarantee, as much performance you lose in the end. Because if, if you're just simply writing like flooding your external system with like messages and don't wait to, and don't have any metadata processing, no committing at all, it's way faster than everything you do like with like wait or have some sort of like complicated commit protocol. So we basically split like the existing <coughs> unified sync in like different kind of mixing interfaces that developers can now use and to abstract away some of the complexity. So in case if you don't need, if you don't need any of the exact once processing, you can still build your simple thing and don't need to implement any of the methods that are completely, um, yeah, overloaded. So that was the first gain. So the second idea is then, this is actually what uh, our, made the highest improvements, we basically, now allowed like um, different kind of topologies. So basically now, um, before the overall architecture was mainly about this writer and committer, what I've, <coughs> what I've showed you before, and now sync developers can basically plug in like their custom topologies to do um, like more real-time work. And so this is like still the idea of that once you basically write your streaming program and load a certain connector that from like a user perspective, this is completely transparent, but now the connector developer has way more flexibility in terms of what they wanna do. And yeah, and now I will basically showcase you some of the scenarios uh, we've seen in, in, in the open source communities uh, on uh, how they leverage these kind of systems to basically, yeah, um, go, um, deal better with these kind of like small file problems. Um, so now the first thing is, okay, how does it actually look like under the hood? So now the idea is what I've showed you before, like the whole transmission between writer and committer was always like the custom committable. And the committable was basically a thing that was defined like by the connector developer. So f we've, as Flink, from a framework perspective, we couldn't really deal with any of th these kind of things. But So we needed to basically develop a stronger like protocol um, around this. So what we came up with is a so-called now, um, the first thing is basically like the committable summary. And this is basically what <coughs> what's now first transferred between a writer and commit. And in case you have like a topology now between those two, it, it's also first getting the committable summary and basically announcing, okay, you can expect that amount of committables that are coming, how many are pending and how many are failed that you can basically decide on your own now in, in what kind of logic, okay, do I want to wait for certain committables? What kind of committables are already gone or already failed? Maybe they failed to commit and they are, uh, and you still want to keep processing. I mean, it could also be that if you're having like a strictly exactly once, once something fails, your whole job runs into like an infinite restart loop or what kind of events you want to process. So we made, like, we made it like now easier to basically <clears throat> allows some sort of like observability inside of your pipeline and you can decide on your own what should happen basically on failure what, and on what kind of things you need to like worry about. So the thing is now that's what I meant. So now the committer has already received like the committable summary and now these are only the commit information. The commit information is just the connector developer defined like commit metadata that is now transferred from the writer to the committer and actually contains now the information on what kind of transactions need to be committed, uh, and so on. <clears throat> yes, and this now brings me now to the use case. I've referred to further. I call it for some reason like online compaction. So the online compaction looks as follows. It looks already quite intimidating on first glance, but uh, I, will, I will, yeah, walk you through the steps so that everyone understands what's happening uh, basically in the background. <clears throat> 
So the main idea is that, so we still, we now have basically two, two uh, additional operators in our pipeline. One is we call like the compact coordinator and one is the compact operator. And these are basically the responsible to like collecting the size information of all the files we've written and then compacting them eventually into like larger files. So, and this compact coordinator and compact operator are now basically part of a custom topology that the developer can now plug into the, before, uh, between the writer and committer. And the global committer we've seen is basically there to basically um, take the information that, have, that has been received from the committer and then um, commit them to some sort of like meta store. So now we basically, the first thing is that always starts, the writer is just simply writing data somewhere. In this case, it's writing for some of the, most of the time, like parquet files into one of the data lakes and saying to the compact coordinator, okay, I've just written these kind of files and they have like size X and now you can deal with this kind of information and decide on what to do. Basically what the compact coordinator does, it basically waits until like it has basically uses some sort of like bin packing strategy until the files that has been written have reached a certain size and then decides, okay, now go ahead, I've, I forward now this message and it has been like snapshot several times to the compact operator that will rewrite these kind of files. And these can also now again run in parallel whereas the compact operator is basically required to always have the parallelism of one because it basically needs to know of all kind of file information to um, basically compute the best uh, bin packing strategy. And the next thing what the compact operator does, they just rewrite the files um, at this point, it's very important to note that none of the files has been actually committed to the meta store, so they haven't, they cannot be read. So they need to be like finally rewritten once in like a compact size before they can actually be committed. So now, once the rewriting um, has been done, the compact, the compact operator forwards again this, this kind of committable information to the committer, and then the committer basically does only its job to say, okay, we are now closing these kind of files. So basically does like, okay, I'm now, um, so internally what will happen is now the files are marked as done. And once the files are marked as done, they basically forward a list of uh, um, files that are finalized to the global committer, which is only basically writing to like the meta store and then registering the files in the data lake. And, and the data lake is basically only some sort of abstraction where basically the meta, uh, the meta store runs and all of the files are placed. Now, you can also already wondering, I think what some of you might notice is that this whole flow is quite inefficient. I mean, <clears throat> so be because the problem is like it could actually take arbitrary long, uh, arbit an arbitrary amount of time until the compact coordinator actually decides on when compact the files and then that they're finally written to the meta store. But this is basically the architecture which we came up with. So, so for example, this w is how the world would look like if you would probably write to Apache Hive since this has been developed like before we can have actually these kind of tr transactional updates and once something is in the meta store, it's actually um, hard to rewrite, rewrite those files. So that's why we needed to have an architecture that also supported these kind of interactions. So the next use case I wanna talk about, it's called offline compaction. And this is like actually what <clears throat> We've seen people, people started implementing that we're using like Apache Iceberg or Delta Lake. Because now we have nowadays the capability of having these kind of like transactional rights um, to some sort of data lakes. So actually the whole abstraction looks, uh, looks quite the same. But in, in the end we, um, now this whole compactor operation is basically at the end. And this, <coughs> and the major difference is that the, it um, decreases drastically the end-to-end -end latency because like the whole pipeline does not need to worry about like compaction because in, in the end the files are already in your data lake so, you, so your downstream applications whoever like consume from the data lake can already read the data although it might be not the most efficient way but over time the compactor will take care of that and basically rewrite your files in the most efficient manner. And since we are mostly talking about like Flink is coming from a streaming space so we're mostly talking about streaming applications um, that basically means you either have already like um, basically allocated some resources uh, for your pipeline so it's not like a big deal to have this very cheap like compact up post-processing hook running that's basically just looking at the collecting the file stats information and then seeing okay when I need to compact and rewrite the files. One thing which also 
is like an additional thing which is also possible since you can also now put something in front of the writer operator. We've also seen that, uh, that some data lake implementers also started like collecting like information about what kind of files you're actually writing. So how, for example, they're partitioned and then deriving like your own uh, shuffle schema and basically see, okay, if I can uh, learn some distribution of my files, I can decide on what kind of shuffling algorithm I might need to use to not end up with uh, for small files in the first place. But I think this whole framework gives you actually these, these kind of capabilities that you can improve over time and basically build all these capabilities already in your connector and your end users do not need to worry about anymore if you have streaming rights to your, to your data lake. Yeah, uh, and basically this uh, sync is av available with uh, Flink uh, 115. So this is like the most recent fl Flink release. I think it has been released in May this year. And so all previous uh, APIs that I've talked about in the talk are still already supported. Even the unified sync API, since we use a lot of the building blocks and what we've learned over the years, this, it's still, still fully compatible and it is uh, supported, but internally, so basically what we have, we have some connectors that are part of the uh, Apache Flink repository and we already like migrated most of them to the new framework and they're running pretty well and we haven't seen uh, any major problems and we're also like in, in contact with all the uh, major data lake providers to like basically um, integrate them into the new framework because initially what they've basically done, like all the things I've just showed you in this talk, they uh, started to build on their own, and this was basically uh, some kind of problem. I, I mean, you know probably that if you're maintaining like a large system and it's especially open source, then you and users want to do something which is currently not possible. They basically like build their own solutions on like semi-public APIs, and then yeah, uh, it goes into like some sort of like um, has a program because every time like we re released like a new Apache Flink version, we ran into trouble because other communities were complaining. Okay, we're not basically guaranteeing like some sort of stability through some of the APIs they were using. And this basically, this whole approach of basically redesigning the sync framework should elevate all these problems in the long term and they can migrate safely to this new sync without um, needing to, yeah, without worrying too much anymore about like using APIs that are not publicly maintained. Yeah, I think this, uh, has been my talk for, for today. I think I'm, yeah, I, there, there's definitely time for questions now. And yeah, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, do you see any threshold limbs with uh, writing to S3 during this? Mm, sorry, can you repeat the question? Do you see any threshold limit when you are compacting the files, smaller files into bigger files, while the streaming process will be writing the files at the same time? Mm -hmm. So we have observed the similar issues while we are compacting as an asynchronous process and then the actual streaming also writing. AWS has this S3 threshold limits that how much you can read write. Mm. There is a standard mechanism says that, hey, you're writing too many files at the same time, slow down. Yes. You see this issue. Uh, so to be honest, since I'm mostly building like the framework to allow these kind of capabilities, <coughs> I'm not fully involved into this, but I definitely talked to one of the users and they also started complaining about these kind of things. So I mean, in the end, the, I think the overall solution is since you now have like basically the framework to limit these kind of options, you could probably build an approach with basically like rate limits, these kind of things already in your connector to make it transparent f for the user. So in the end, I would say that these kind of dealing with these kind of situations is now the responsibility of basically the connector developer. So if you're like, for example, Apache Iceberg is like building that connector, then they are Delta Lake connector, then they are responsible to building these kind of rate limiting capabilities. Although I can also imagine like in the long run in Flink, so we offer like already like a file sync that um, we can make this as a general feature on how to write files and build this uh, in, but currently this is not supported as far as, as, far as I know in or first three. But yeah, we've heard this a lot over the years and we are thinking about like making the file sync more applicable for these kind of use cases and also like build into our S3 file format that our file system we call it, uh, this kind of retry mechanism and yeah, and this kind of thresholding.
So for extensible unified sync, do you have connector for Mongo? MongoDB? MongoDB. Um, good question. Uh, I don't think that there's currently a MongoDB connector within the main repository. But so we're currently also reworking like how connectors are organized. And what we basically want to achieve is that the connectors uh, live in their own separate repositories within the Apache organization. So basically there will be like a Flink connector MongoDB. I definitely know that there has been an open pull request and people wanted to contribute it, but we had to push back slightly because of this externalization. So we're actually currently in the mood of we're externalizing all the connectors in their separate repositories. So to also allow like faster releases of connectors because currently like the whole connector release cycle is basically bound to Apache Flink, which can sometimes take up to like three to six to six months until you can release a new connector version, which is probably not suitable if, if you want to just change something slightly. So I would need to look up if there's a concurrently supported MongoDB connector. I remember there has been in the past, but I'm not sure what kind of state it currently is. I have one more question. Uh, <coughs> do you, uh, in, in the Flink with extensible unified sync, do you support exactly one semantics end-to-end? -end? Um, so basically, what what I can say is that it supports. Ex Sorry, I need to drink something first. Um, so the thing is that the whole writer committer abstraction supports in the end exactly one's guarantees. So now it's a bit to the connector developers because Flink basically with this new unified sync framework, we basically gave a bit of the responsibility of guaranteeing exactly one's guarantees and batch and streaming mode inside of these topologies back to the. De custom developers, because if they cannot guarantee any more processing in these kind of topologies, then it's not exactly end-to-end -end anymore. But like from a framework perspective, it should be possible to implement. So that's 